before we jump into UFC 217, I got one more guest coming your way, guys. So let's jump right into that. Alright guys, welcome back to Pure Evil MMA. I got a special guest for us here today who's actually going to be on one of the UFC cards coming up at UFC 218 in Detroit. We got Bobby Wambacher coming back on the show for the second time, maybe even the third time at this point. Bobby, what have you been up to since uh, you know the last time we spoke? And my first question to you really, uh, before we jump into it, is how far ahead of time do you know that you're working at an event? Um, this one, they uh, notified me back in the beginning of September, so a couple months generally. So there's been a lot of weird stuff going on in MMA. I got to scratch your head about a lot of things, so I'm really happy that you're joining me here today. But, um, you know, what have, uh, what have you been up to since the last time we spoke? What, uh, what changes in your life? You got a new place to live in? Uh, you know, what have you been up to before we jump into the whole MMA thing? Yeah, since last time we talked, uh, I moved back to Utah. I uh, got closer to the kids. Uh, um, uh, in a new relationship with somebody special, I'm not going to get into that right now, but how often they have you like running around from, uh, you know, place to place working. Um, pretty frequently this weekend I'll be in South Dakota. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I go around pretty frequently. It's almost like being a trucker. I mean, what's, uh, what's some of the places that you've been just to update our audience that maybe not be, uh, familiar with some of the refs and you know how much they really have to do because you guys really are the unspoken heroes of MMA I don't think they realize that you guys actually have a home life and that you guys travel an awful lot yeah um, I've actually uh, repped in 27 different states and there's only a handful of refs that actually rep outside of their home state or maybe their next state um, but I, I've been blessed to actually uh, ref in 27 different states so I'm pretty blessed with that I mean, you look at like Big John McCarthy. I'll be at a uh, you know line fight or something, and then or uh, you know Big Dan. You know these guys are flying out to Vegas to uh, you know the East Coast back and forth like all different days. It's just really hectic. I don't know how uh, how a lot of you guys do it. And really, the real unspoken heroes are your guys' girls or uh, you know husbands or wives or whatever in your family. So uh, you know it's nice that you're back in Utah, close to the kids. But uh, really. Po uh, really popular thing going around last week with uh you know the fights over there in poland and i don't want to be too specific but i want to scratch your head on like what are the designated areas for like cornermen and uh you know what, what really are the rules for uh you know what you can and cannot do outside of the ring if you are part of the team sure um i i, I don't know about it in, in poland but i, I know with the in the states that i work um chip, typically you can have uh, two cornermen uh in the corner they have to be, remain seated at all times and it's a certain area um it's not like they can just have free reign it's a certain designated spot where the corner is um and that's where their, their chairs will be um but they, they're not allowed to get up they have to remain seated until uh, the 10 second bell and uh you know they can instruct you know their fighter but they're not to not to just to to yell out to the opposing fighter corner or anything like that because the thing is, you got to keep in mind the fighter's safety as well, I'm sure, uh, you know, 100% of the time in case something very serious happens, someone has to rush into the cage, I'm sure there's a designated area for, uh, you know, the medical team. Because usually when I'm covering events, I'm about a good, I'd say, four feet away from the, uh, you know, the ring or, or the cage or whatever it is. And I know, like, you can't move. You can be a VIP or whatever, but you, you really can't move. So have you ever seen anything like that before in the past? Uh, you know, cornermen trying to follow, uh, you know, their fighter around, or have you seen anything similar to that before? Um, yeah, it happens. Uh, typically, it happens mainly before the fight and then before the, they get in the cage. Once um, they're, in the, they're in the cage, generally the, the state uh, commission and inspectors have directed the, the excess people out of the area, and, and they usually have pretty good control over uh, the fighting area. So it usually doesn't uh, interfere with, with the bout at all. Is it usually the refs that are, you know, making a halt to that, or isn't there usually somebody on the side, security or something, that should have should usually stop something like that? Yeah, the, the off ref, um, usually there's two refs minimum at events. Uh, the ref that's not in the cage kind of, kind of helps watch the outside of the cage, make sure the corners stay down, make sure nobody in, comes up close to the judges, and he just helps the commission out with that. I always wondered about, you know, where Herb Dean goes after his fight, and then he has to come back in, what what they're doing. So that's, uh, that's kind of cool to hear some uh, behind the scenes here. So I was thinking about it. I was like, you know, what questions 
have I not really asked Bobby or, or any of these uh, refs before? And me and you have kind of spoke before in the past about what you guys do before, uh, you know, the fighters go in there, kind of give them a heads up. But I had to ask you, son, you know, there's a lot of fights that maybe get called a little bit too soon. So I, I have a question, you know, before the fighters go out there, have you ever seen anybody been like, you know, I might get in trouble. You should let it go on a little bit because sometimes I do bounce back. How do you respond to a fighter that does ask you if it, if it is asked? Um, I do get asked that and uh, I, I give them the same response. It, it, you know, I'm there for fighter safety and I can't allow one fighter to take more, more damage just because they think they're more resilient. Um, you know, everybody's judged on the same, uh, I guess scale, um, you know, as far as fights getting stopped too soon, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess that happens. But uh, for me, I, I'm not going to let one fighter take unnecessary damage just because, um, you know, that's what they think. You know, they're fighters. They're, they, they, you know, Dana White had a uh, thing today, I think it was today, um, about the Mark Hunt situation, you know, yeah. about uh, having to pr protect fighters from themselves. And then that's the same thing for a referee. You know, you'll get fighters that, uh, you know, they'll go out on their shield and, and that's all there is to it. Um, you know, they're fighters. Um, you know, so whenever you got to stop it and they they get irate and, you know, get in your face and all that other stuff, that's just, you know, that, that's them. They're, they, they're a fighter. They don't ever want to quit. They don't ever want to lose. Um, but as, as the official, you know, it's our job to protect them at all times. So are you guys also thinking about like pain tolerance when it comes to, you know, different weight classes or even, you know, the female fighters, like how much, uh, you know, pain they can really take before you got to call like a TKO or something. Does all that come into question? It's not really about pain. It's about un unanswered shots or not intelligently defending yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, they could be little, little hammer fist shots comparative to, you know, right hooks and stuff, but if they're not defending themselves, they're, they're the same equivalent to, you know, getting a jab from your feet. So, um, you know, it doesn't really matter the, the amount of pain or anything. It's more, are they defending themselves? Because some people have a higher pain threshold, um, you know, and they could take more. But if they're not defending themselves, then it's got to end. So, Bobby, as people are listening to this, whether they're, you know, tuning into our video cast, watching this or listening to it on the podcast, I'm sure as, you know, I'm going to be asking a couple more questions, uh, they might think of a question of their own that they might want to ask you. So, uh, you know, can they reach out to you on Twitter? Yep, I'm uh, Twitter at Bobby Wombacher, all one word. So that's at B-O-B-B-Y-W-O-M-B-A-C-H-E-R, just in case you guys are tuning in to the podcast. Now, kind of... Uh, you know, hang off of that last question. Um, you know, especially this weekend, we saw a lot of fighters talking to the crowd and then we see some of the fans throw objects. Now, have you ever been in a, a situation where objects have been thrown inside the cage? And, and what do you do in a situation like that? Are, should you stop the fight or do you wait for a null in action? What do you do if something like that does happen? Um, it depends what's thrown in and where it's at. Uh... You know, um, just this last fight I did in, you know, in Nebraska, they actually, uh, I got a, a water bottle thrown in and hit me in the back during the middle of the fight, you know, and uh, you, you just kick the water bottle to make sure it's out of the way. And then you, because it's not the fighter's fault, you know, yeah. pe fans will be fans and uh, I'm positive security dealt with it and you know, I didn't even think twice about it. So, you know, that stuff does happen. Also, uh, you know, talking about, you know, late calls and stuff like that. When something like that does happen or, or you make a call that you're like, oh, maybe I should have made it sooner or, or whatever happens, happens. Uh, who do you reach out to or, or do people reach out to, uh, you know, other referees to talk about it? I mean, how, how does that process go? Uh, well, I know for me, what I do is I, I talk to the referees that are at the event. Um, so, um, you know, after the f fight, I will sit down and, you know, if I have a question, I'll, I'll ask them and, kind of get their opinion, pick their brain, and maybe even the judges as well. Um, but typically, you know, when I stop a fight, I'm pretty confident I did it at the right time. But there's always those times where you're like, well, did I let one shot go too many or two shots? And you'll ask the other officials and get their opinion. And sometimes, you know, they're like, yeah, you probably could have stopped it sooner. Or they're like, no, that's perfect time. You know, So you rely on the other officials. 
you know, like my mom, she uh, she's a nurse. She has to take like uh, refresher courses. I went to EMT school. You're required to take refresher courses. I know that Herb and Big John do uh, their courses. Are those also open to public? Like I know there's a lot of people out there that are interested in, uh, you know, judging or even officiating, uh, refing. Uh, is is those seminars are they open to the public and uh, you know how often do you guys hold stuff like that? Um, they are offered to the public. Uh, anybody can attend. It's very expensive, um, and the pass rate is very low um, because you got to be on the game to to pass it. So you know anybody could go to it, but that doesn't mean they're going to pass it or be you know certified or whatever. Um, but if if they're willing to pay the money and you know. Depending upon which one you go to, it, it ranges anywhere from you know 250 bucks to 1900 for the course. So, um, so. is that for refing and judging, or uh, or just refing? Um, usually, you choose if you want to do both. Um, but they they're held both at the the same weekend. Usually, one's uh, uh, a Friday or a Saturday, and then the other one's a Saturday or Sunday, and then then it's done. So I actually have this question further down, but since it relates, um, you know, do you think referees should also, once they're retired or, or done doing that, do you think that they should be judges? Do you think they should switch over to the judging since they've been inside the cage or the or the ring? Um, a lot of uh, us refs, we do, we are licensed to judge as well. Um, but for me, myself, uh, I, I like staying focused on uh, just one aspect and not, uh, you know, having to, to mess with the, the both of them uh, because the thing about judging is it is very mentally taxing. I mean, you've got to be focused on every second of that fight and uh, people don't give those judges enough credit. I mean, it's uh, very mentally taxing. So are you familiar with like, well, you know, the courses that the judges have to go through? Have you taken them? Yep. I've passed them. Uh, and I judge uh, local shows and stuff like that at times. Um, and some of the times you'll, you'll be a ref and, and uh, the other ref will be there, and the ref that's not in the cage will actually be the, the third judge. So, um, yeah, some of the commissions, that's how they work, and hey, that's fine too. But what are some of the things that you guys have to, uh, you know, brush up on or, or really uh, learn about before you can really get qualified? Well, the big thing that, that a lot of people, you know, a lot of people can read about the rules, and they can memorize the rules, and, you know, there's only 29 of them. Um, you know, so th that's – not the hardest part the, where it gets them is actually having to physically apply the holds and break field them. hours. Um, right. Yep. So, so like they'll, you'll draw, you got to do a Kimura and you got to be able to explain exactly what you're doing. You got to be, you know, where the pressure points are. And then uh, more importantly, how to disengage it, um, disassemble it. So you know, I never even, I never even thought about that. So when you guys see like new moves come out, like, uh, you know, big Ben Rothwell, like a year ago, he was doing that, uh, you know, go, go choke. You guys like have to, stay up to date on some of the new jiu-jitsu or Brazilian jiu-jitsu and some of these moves that are going around. Cause I never even thought about that. You guys have to disengage it. Yeah, absolutely. We got to, anytime there's a uh, new, new choke or something that gets around uh, the refereeing community, it circulates through there pretty quickly because uh, you know, you don't want to ever be caught in a position where you don't know what's going on in there. Um, and, and for the most part, most chokes all are a variation of the, the basic ones. So, if you know where the where you know the carotid's getting cut off or you know whatever it is, and you know where to put your arm to separate it so to create space, you know that won't change depending upon the variation of the hold. So crazy, some of the stuff that uh, you know you guys really have to be so alert in there. You guys don't get enough credit. Um, you know, my other question to you is because the fan, the MMA fans are so brutal sometimes. Have you ever gone on your Twitter and just seen uh, you know some some wild questions or or any a uh, backlash? They just, you're just like, uh, oh, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I don't use Twitter that much. I just started using it again in the last couple of days. But, yeah, I'll get a lot of questions on Facebook. And then, um, you know, some people even get bold enough. They, they just post stuff on the Internet itself. And uh, sometimes you just shake your head. And, uh, you know, if you don't uh, give it uh, life and let it grow legs, it, it dies off, especially if it's not warranted. So. Yeah, I think it's really funny when you see some of the fighters coming out and, uh, you know, attacking some of the trolls. There's all good fun in it. When you when you sign up for a platform where you're putting yourself out there, you got to expect that, uh, you know, there's some wild people out there. So, which leads me to my next question. Somebody brought this up to me at the bar the other night, and I was like, you know what? That's a, that's a great question. I got to ask Bobby this. 
Do you guys, after events, are there like, you know, there's like firefighter bars, there's cop bars, are there referee bars? Like, do you guys all hang out at a referee bar? Um, no, a lot of us, you know, we'll, we'll, it's been, a, what people don't understand, say for like the UFC event, you know, we'll get there probably about three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and they go till, you know, 11 o'clock or whatever. So, so we're there all, all night essentially. So what we typically do is we'll go somewhere and uh, get something to eat and, uh, but not a lot of drinking. I don't drink at all. So, um, you know, I wouldn't partake in that, but, uh, mainly it's just, uh, you know, we eat dinner together or, you know, whatever and unwind and, uh, that's about it. So are you allowed, like, do they tell you, I mean, it's kind of a professional thing, uh, anyway, but not to like mingle with the fighters. Um, you mean after parties or before? You know, you know anything because if you guys become friends with them, it could be controversial to a lot of people sometimes. Uh, you know, is that kind of like the unwritten cardinal rule of it all? Is that why you guys you know, kind of stick close to one another rather than, you know, mix with the fighters? Sure. Um, well, it's MMA is really a small, small community, even as big as it is. Yeah. Um, you know, I've ref many of the fighters are in the UFC and when I go there, they'll come up and they'll say, hi, you know, how you doing? So you, you kind of know them, but, uh, yeah, you tip, you don't want to hang out with them just due to conflict of interest. And, you know, you may not be doing anything wrong, but the perception from somebody else may be that you are. So as officials, we, we do distance ourselves from the, you know, the mingling and hanging out stages. Um, but that isn't to say that we'll be somewhere and a fighter won't be in the same restaurant or whatever, and they'll just come up and, you know, want to chat about the fight or whatever. And that's fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, typically, you know, we don't go hang out with fighters, no. You know, another good question that just kind of popped up is, uh, you know, sometimes you get you two, you know, the you and the fighter are mingling for not the right reasons. Do you have to stay up on your Brazilian jiu-jitsu? Do you have to take class and stuff like that? Because sometimes fighters might backlash at you if they're, you know, not happy with the call or, or something, you know, their blood pressure's going and their adrenaline's pumping. We've seen it before in the past plenty of times. So, uh, you know, do you kind of find it really important that, you know, you kind of stay brushed up on your uh, wrestling or, or what it is that's going to help you feel more confident if that situation does occur? Yeah, you, you absolutely have to be on top of it. I mean, it's unpredictable. Yeah. Um, you know, typically, uh, I'll speak for the majority of the fighters that they know not to mess with the ref for, for numerous reasons. I mean, number one, uh, they're going to lose their license. And uh, depending upon, you know, what they do or whatever, you know, uh, they could lose their license permanently. So they don't they wouldn't risk that. Uh, but they also know that most of us refs understand the fight game and we're, we're well versed in it and they, they don't want to mess with us. I mean, I, I tell a lot of people, you know, all I really have to do is neutralize somebody for 10 or 15 seconds because by then the cage door is going to be open and there's going to be plenty of people to help. So, um, you know, the, 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 most fighters aren't going to do that. Um, I've had a, a fighter get in my face maybe two or three times after a fight. Um, but they, they quickly realize that that's not the form to do it and you know like i tell all the fighters you know if there's a problem with a call i make or you're unhappy with it you know don't don't make a commotion out here you know uh, you know let me know i'll come back in the back and you know I'll, I'll talk to you and your coaches and explain what i seen why i did it um you know and kind of give them answers because look they've trained for six weeks eight weeks whatever it is you know they deserve a a fair um outcome and they need to they deserve to to know why something happened and uh so i i'm more than happy to go back and uh you know get with them and their team and explain it so that they understand and, and can move forward so another big thing i want to ask you before we let you go is uh you know the whole eye poke thing how many eye pokes do you think it should really be granted because we do see a lot of fighters and i shouldn't say a lot but Sometimes we do see fighters use it to their advantage. They know they can get away with one, maybe two. Well, what's your take on the whole eye poking? It, it, it depends. Now with the new rule where you can't have your fingers outstretched pointing towards the face, yeah. you know, um, <clears throat> that that eliminates a lot of it because right away you're already warning them. So then if, if there's an eye poke, you've already warned them in the back. You've warned them most likely in the cage. Um, so it's not like, uh, well, you know, I didn't know. No, we went over that in the rules meeting. I mean, it was, it's clear you cannot do that any longer. Um, and then it, obviously the severity, you know, if, if they got their hand out and the guy's leaning forward and it connects, that's a little different than him out, you know, outreaching his hands and, and sticking his finger in his eye. Um, 
so it depends on the situation and there, there's a lot of variables but um, you know I guess there's no hard fast rule on how many till you get disqualified or a point taken away or anything like that just the variables that, that are included so we hear what you say when uh, you know the fighters are coming face to face and you know whether they decide to touch gloves or not but we really don't see what happens behind uh, behind the scenes so can you give our audience a quick preview of uh, you know what you say behind scenes uh, to both fighters do you say it to them both at the same time or do you grab them separately how, how does that go down well, it, that that varies on the show you're at. So if you're at a local regional show, you typically do a group rules meeting where all the fighters and corners come in and you go through the rules. Um, <clears throat> you know, I like to go through, you know, what I'm looking for on submissions, verbal submissions, tap outs, you know, uh, open hand strikes, you know, that will be considered a tap out, you know, explaining everything to them. Um, you know, and then uh, I cover all the rules. And then at the end of the group rules meeting, I go around to whatever fighters I'm refing and I'll go one on one with them and explain, you know, ask them if they have any other questions, explain again the big things to me, like the back of the head, the grabbing of the cage, make sure they understand the new grounded fighter rules, you know, the submissions, things like that. Um, and then when you get to like your Bellators and your UFCs, they don't do a, a group rules meeting, it's all one on one. So you got to go to each individual fighter and, you know, ex make sure they're. <clears throat> they're ready to go and they understand they don't have any questions and you know again when you do the when I do the one-on-ones at the bigger events it's the same sort of thing I could just go through the basics you know what I'm looking for in submissions um, go through the rules the you know the main ones uh, what I'm looking for ask them if there's anything that you know they're they have concern with or anything they don't know um, obviously when you get to that level they they should know the rules um, so it's more of just getting familiar and making sure they understand it and they don't have any questions about it. What are some of like the most common questions that you usually hear as a ref? Uh, <clears throat> the big ones uh, typically are centered around what a grounded fighter is, um, <clears throat> especially with the new rule with the two hands, you know, you're having the backs of the fists or the palms down. Um, so you'll, you'll get that. Um, then in the amateur ranks, some of the um, uh, states don't allow – twisting leg submissions and elbows and stuff like that. So it's just answering those questions. Um, but typically a lot of it is about um, the ground of fighter. So this is one of the most important questions. I wanted to save it to last. You just mentioned the new rules coming into play. How long until you think, you know, more of the states are going to start signing onto it? Because it is confusing event to event, wondering if it's, uh, you know, more inclined to a 10-8 round for the judges or, you know, like the hands and stuff like that. How long do you think this process is going to take before we see more states opening up to, uh, you know, the new rules that were laid? You know, that I don't know because it's all politically driven. Um, so some states will never change it and uh, some some you're just dragging their feet or, or whatever the process is but <clears throat> i'll go on the record and say hey, it's not fair you know to to have different rules for different states you know when i, I like i said i've repped in 27 states and one of the first things i have to do when i get there is you know what rules are we using tonight and for me it's a little little easier um, because i know typically all the states i work in now what they use but for a fighter who goes state to state you know if your training camp is eight weeks and you've trained elbows and knees and then you get to the venue and they're like, yeah, no elbows or knees you know, or, you know, yeah, this is a grounded fighter or whatever, you know, that, that isn't the time for a fighter to, to discover these things. Cause now you're, you're going to send their, their, their mind track all sideways when they should be really focused on, you know, getting in the cage and, and performing. And uh, it's unfortunate. And I see a lot of fighters, you know, second guess themselves in the cage, you know, because they don't know. And, um, you know, it's just unfair to the fighters. So before we let you go, I know that you have this upcoming UFC event for UFC 218. What is it going to look like from today until you get out there? How many days ahead of time are you going to be, uh, you know, heading out to Detroit? And, uh, you know, what's your schedule pretty much look like? Um, well, I got an event this upcoming weekend. And then after that, uh, I just got a lot of uh, interviews coming up, a lot of uh, things like that. Uh, I will fly out uh, December 1st, which is the Friday. Uh, probably in the morning, I, I'm assuming I've got a, uh, uh, I'm meeting with the Boys and Girls Club of Detroit. Uh, they're bringing all their uh, Metro Detroit uh, Boys and Girls Clubs together to one spot. I'm going to talk to them for a little bit on Friday night. Um, then uh, I'll head back to the hotel, hang out. Um, you know, Saturday I'll relax in the morning and then uh, get to the arena early afternoon and uh, be ready to go.
And do you know what fighters uh, you ref but ahead of time? You don't have to tell us or anything if you're not inclined to. But uh, you know, how 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 ahead of time do you know the exact fighters that you're going to be refing? Um, typically, uh, it's when you get to the venue. I know Nevada. Whenever they do theirs, they have to vote on the uh, uh, main event and co-main event usually. So <clears throat> the public knows who the ref and judges are for those. But um, for the most part, uh, we all wait, and when we get to the arena, the uh, commission will give you your assignments. And then um, you're ready to go. Well, what do you think about fighters having a say in, uh, you know, picking the ref? You think they should have somewhat of a say in it, or no? No, nope. uh, because then you then you get a uh, conflict of interest. You get, uh, you know, the good old boys club. Uh, <clears throat> I think the commission uh, signing them is the right way to do it, and it keeps uh, everybody from, you know, any any confusion or or bias uh, being played. I agree with you there. Bobby, if there's anything else that you'd like to discuss, now is the time before we, uh, you know, sign off here. Yeah, I, you know, go to my uh, Facebook page. It's uh, uh, MMA referee Bobby Wambacher. Um, you'll see a link on there as well. Um, go to uh, Hornbuckle Warriors. Uh, that's on my page. Uh, I had a, a friend just pass away on Friday from uh, leukemia and a few other things, and he's got some young children. Uh, so there's a place on there to donate some money if you can to help out the family. I know that he's got three young kids, and one of them is only a f uh, six weeks old, maybe. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, if you get a chance, go check it out. Read the story. Like I said, he just passed away on Friday. Uh, so, yeah, I'd like to see uh, his family get helped out with that. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, I'm excited, and I am uh, appreciate being on. Matter of fact, I think I saw a bloody elbow post, uh, an article with the GoFundMe account on there. So, you know what? I'll, I'll share that on the Pure Evil MMA Facebook page so it's a little easier for everybody to find. Make sure you guys are following Bobby on Twitter at Bobby Wambacher. That's B-O-B-B-Y-W-O-M-B-A-C-H-E-R. I'll share it on the Twitter page, guys. Thank you so much, Bobby, for coming on, and we wish you best of skill and safe trip once you get to Detroit in your upcoming event. Thank you for coming on Pure Evil MMA.